The title for tonight's message is one that's heavy in my heart. It's Wilt Thou Not Revive Us Again? And that's simply taken from Psalm 85. So that's where we're going tonight. Wilt Thou Not Revive Us Again? Psalm 85. It says, verse 1, Lord, thou hast been favourable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thy anger. Turn us. O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger towards us to cease. Verse 5, wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Verse 6, wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Verse 10, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. Verse one says, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Lord, you have been favorable unto your land. So, Lord, that's the self-existent, the all-sufficient Jehovah that's used here. Lord, Yahweh, Lord, the one who introduced himself to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, when <coughs> Moses says, if the people ask me who has sent me to deliver them, who am I going to say? And he reveals himself as Jehovah, the great I am. So this is Lord, the great I am, has been favorable unto the land. And you know, I was thinking, we can say the exact same thing here today in this place. Lord, you have been favorable unto this land of Ireland. And I've brought up a few pictures that you can see in the PowerPoint, because we know that back in 1859, this land experienced a powerful move of God, a powerful revival that produced more than a hundred thousand converts to Jesus Christ. And many new churches had to be built, even in Ballymena, to host all the new believers. God has been favorable onto our land. And right here, where we're standing tonight, you're, what you're tuning in, right here where we are is actually a place of old wells. Because we're only two miles down the road from Ahockle. And first Ahockle, in the, on the 14th of March, 1859, at a spring communion in first Ahockle, with some from first, one from first Ahockle here tonight, in the spring communion of first Ahockle, it says in the history books, uh, there was a significant outpouring of God's Spirit and many came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ as a result. So that was just a few miles down the road and the Reverend Dave Adams was a minister there at that time and there was such a crowd in apparently that the galleries began to sink and I sat in those galleries as a young child growing up so I know you can actually see the galleries began to sink and he had to order them to leave the church and they all went outside into the streets and then there was a certain man, James Bankhead, may be familiar to some. He started to address the converts from the step of one of the nearby shops. 
and it says it was raining heavily, it was all muddy, but the people stood for hours to hear the word of God and they fell prostrate on their faces in the mud in repentance. So that's what God did many years ago on in this land. So Lord, you have been favourable onto this land. We can all say that here tonight. Maybe he's been favourable onto your land as well when you're tuning in. But you know, we're not limiting God to what he's done in the past and saying, wasn't it great? God did that back then. Because we're saying, as it says in verse six, will thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? You know, one of my favourite verses is in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 19. It says, behold, that means take notice, look, give attention to this. Behold, God says, I will do a new thing. Now, now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Another translation says, forget all that, for it's nothing compared to what I'm going to do. Forget all that, it's nothing compared to what I'm going to do, for I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I believe there's people even in here tonight and watching who have seen this and know that there's something coming up. See, I've already begun, do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I'll create rivers in the wasteland. And another book I like in the Bible is Habakkuk. And in chapter three of Habakkuk and verse one, it says, this is a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet. But it's an unusual sort of prayer because it says, if you're reading it in the Amplified, it says it's a prayer set to wild, enthusiastic and triumphal music. So I'm not quite sure how it went. But this is what he says in verse one. He says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. He says, I stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Repeat them in our day. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. See, Habakkuk had heard about God's fame. He knew what God could do on behalf of his people. And he cried out to God, Lord, repeat them in our day. You know, chapter one of Habakkuk, it starts with the burden of Habakkuk because he looked in his land and he saw trouble. He saw violence, he saw injustice, he saw sin, and he was burdened. It says in verse one of chapter one, this is the burden of Habakkuk, the prophet. But then in chapter two, it tells us that he positions himself for change and he waits to see what God's going to show him that he's going to do. It says he then receives a vision it says the vision is for an appointed time. He says, at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry, it says then. And in chapter three, we have this prayer that I read at the beginning. I've heard of your fame. Repeat them in our day. Repeat them in our day. And then Psalm 44, similar words. We have heard with our ears of God. Our fathers have told us the deeds that you did in their days, in days of old. Psalm 44. So we've all heard what God can do. He has been favorable to our land. But the verse tonight, wilt thou not revive us again? that thy people may rejoice in ye, thee. So the question that needs to be asked is, what is revival? What is revival? <coughs> well, it's not necessarily evangelism because we know that it involves God's people, but it does indeed result in many souls coming to Christ, so it's involved in it. And it's not necessarily emotionalism, but we also know that there will be manifestations associated with it. But revival literally, revive is re, meaning again or repeats, and vive, which means to live. 
So it's literally to be vibrant and full of life again. So it's talking to God's people who have maybe once been fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, but they've just become apathetic and blend it into the world and need to be revived. So it's like God making the dry bones live again. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm going to read the, that little story about the valley of dry bones and what God, God did in that valley. I'm reading it in the King James tonight. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the midst of a valley that was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say to them, O oh, ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto the bones, Behold, I shall cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and shall bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophecy unto the wind, prophecy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come over from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Amen. So God, it's God making the dry bones live again. It's God stirring the embers that are, are going out but need to be fanned into flame again. And it's God bringing his people closer to his presence. That's revival. Dr. Arnold Cook, he describes revival as, I've been reading a few books in this. This is what he says, a time when God comes down, when the word comes alive, when sin is revealed, when brokenness abounds, when confession is made, when forgiveness is granted and broken relationships restored. But what's the origin of revival? Well, it's in this verse. It says, wilt thou not? Wilt thou not? God is the source of revival, never man. God is the source. It's not something you can schedule or plan for revival. It's not something we can schedule. We don't work it up. Revival is something that God does. It's the work of God. Wilt thou not? Will you not? And so men will be forced to say, this is the Lord's doing and it is mighty in our eyes. So a revival is not something you can pencil into your, your planner, your calendar. And it's not something an evangelist can carry in a suitcase. You see, the danger is we do not light fires. I hear a lot of that today, but we do not light fires. God lights the fire. In fact, it's very dangerous to talk about lighting fires because I came across this verse in Isaiah 50, verse 11. This is what it says in the Amplified. Behold, all you enemies of your own selves who attempt to kindle your own fires, who surround and gird yourselves with momentary sparks, darts and firebrands that you set aflame. It says, walk by the light of your self-made fire and of the sparks that you have kindled for yourself, if you will. But this you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in grief and in torment. So we don't, want to, we don't want to be trying to light the fires ourselves. This is God's work. We want revival fire, not strange fire. Do you remember it said in Leviticus chapter 10, it was a story of Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron, 
who offered profane fire uh, before the Lord. The Hebrew word translated profane literally means strange or foreign. So we don't want strange fire, foreign fire. We want true, genuine revival. And it's a sovereign work of God and only God gets the glory. You know, we can't treat God as if we're in the drive through at Burger King. You know, their slogan, their advertising slogan is for their, I think it's for their broiled burgers, have it your own way. We can't have it our own way. It's when we come to God in submission, say, have it your way, Lord, that is ever going to happen. Andrew Strong, in his book on revival, says the difference between revivals that are true and those that are false are one is centered around the cross and deep repentance and holiness and death to self, as well as forgiveness, cleansing and infilling of the Holy Spirit. The other is centered around excitement and soulishness and a seeking after experiences for their own sake, often with selfish agendas like bless me, give me more, rather than a focus on getting right with God. So that's the origin of revival. Wilt thou not? And this is a plea for revival. He says, wilt thou not? He doesn't say, can you, Lord? He's not doubting the Lord's ability. He knows God can. He's not like those doubting Israelites in the wilderness saying, can you spread a table in the wilderness and doubting it? No, he's not saying that. He's saying, wilt thou not? It's a plea, wilt thou not? Revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee. He knows God can do it. He's, he knows that God is able to do exceeding, abundantly, but of all that we can ever ask and imagine. And we know that too, way beyond our wildest dreams. But we have to remember it's not on man's terms. It's in God's terms. God has given us the guidelines on how we should be doing our part in preparation for us. And for that, we need to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, a well-known verse, probably one of the most well-known verses in the Old Testament. But it's a powerful promise from God's word, and yet it is a conditional promise. It says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their lands. What does it start with? It starts with the little word, if, if. It's a promise to God's people. But you know, we have to act on those promises. It doesn't just say, it happens, it says if. We need to act on the promise. Someone says too many in church are sitting on the premises but not standing on the promises. He said we don't want to be sitting on the premises, we want to be standing on the promises of God. But we have to act on this, it says if, if. It's conditional on the willingness of God's people to do the Lord's will, plain and simple. Are we willing to do it God's way? If changes everything. Do you remember in the Bible it says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. People are just saying, ask whatever you wish, but no, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. If changes everything. It says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from unrighteousness. If. It says, if two or three of you agree on earth as touching anything they, they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. If, if changes it all. And it says here, if my people who are called by my name, now we can apply that to us today. That's us, that's us. You see, God calls us his people. You're my people, he said. We belong to God. You see, Peter said, he said, a people belonging to God, he says, that you would declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous lights. You see, we were bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So we're his people tonight. And this is the challenge for us. If my people 
So if you're part of that family of God, this is a challenge for you. If my people who are called by my name, what does it say? Shall humble themselves. That word humble comes from the Greek word, or from the Hebrew word, meaning to bend the knee, to subdue and to break. To bend the knee, subdue and break. And I believe until there is brokenness, there's really no blessing. It's one of the primary ingredients in every revival you read about. You know, in the Welsh revival in 1905, Christians came to understand, quote the history book, there must be a bending before there is a mending. That's what it said. The price of revival is a total renunciation of self-interest, and selfishness and sinfulness. And I love the hymn we were supposed to sing tonight, but it's slow. A wind of God, come bend us, break us till humbly we confess our needs. Then in your tenderness remake us, revive, restore, for this we plead. You know, when we humble ourselves to the Lord, we're, we're acknowledging his lordship and his headship over our lives. We're admitting our weakness, but we're pulling on his power and strength. We're saying, Lord, I can't, but Lord, you can. It says in the Bible, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And I'm going to read a verse in Isaiah 57, verse 15. This is what it says. It says, thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in a high and holy place, but also with him who is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So how important is humility? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. And there's more. It says, humble themselves and pray. Humble themselves and pray. You see, prayer, I was thinking this week, in essence, is humility in action. It's humility in action. You see, the praying person sees his own inability and recognizes God's ability. And this causes him to come before the Lord to seek the help that he needs. John Wesley, who was instrumental in many moves of God, he said, everything by prayer and nothing without it. Everything by prayer and nothing without it. And every great revival in history also has been birthed in the position of prayer. Every revival. History books say, says there was an extraordinary time of prayer, constraining believers to much secret and united prayer, pressing them to labor fervently in their supplications. And if you go to Kells, to the origin of the revival here, to that uh, site at Tony Brack, there's a little plaque and it says, the, this was a place where there were fervent prayer meetings that preceded the 1859 revival. Fervent prayer meetings. You see, God will only intervene when we really take the time to intercede. Are we interceding for our land? Are we asking God for revival? James tells us the power of prayer, it says this, in fact, chapter five, verse 16 to 18, talks about prayer. And in that it says, the effectual verbal prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Psalm two, verse eight, God challenges, ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance and the ends of your earth is your possession. Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. But folks, it's up to us. Are we prepared to pray? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, 
and there's more. And seek my face. We read last week in Psalm 63, but the heart of David, he said, Oh God, you're my God. Earnestly I seek you. My inner self thirsts for you. My soul longs for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. I have looked upon you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. That was the heart of David. In Psalm 24 verse 6 it says, This is the generation of those that seek him, who seek your face. Folks, there's many seeking God for his hand and what they can get from God. But I want us to be a generation who seek God's face. Who seek his face. It says in 1 Chronicles 16, 11, Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Seek his face always. And we know in Hebrews 11 it says, Without faith it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards, or rewards those who earnestly seek him. Jeremiah 29, we know well the verse, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. But it goes on to say, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. We need to realize that revival is about falling in love with Jesus all over again. Seeking him with the whole heart. It says in Hosea chapter 10 verse 12, Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. Fallow ground is soil that once was ploughed and ready for seed, but due to neglect, it's become nothing but hardened clumps of clay. Break up your fallow grounds, for it's time to seek the Lord. I challenge each one of you as I challenge myself to seek God's face like never before. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. In other words, repent. You know, we're not to become acclimatized to the culture that's all around us. God's calling us to a place of repentance, a place of holiness, of separateness. And revival is always dependent upon repentance. Turn us, said the psalmist in our psalm tonight, verse 4. Turn us, was the prayer of this patriotic psalmist. Turn us, that means cause us to repent. All the glorious promises to the five out of the seven churches at the very last book in the Bible in Revelation were all conditional, remember, on the one word, repent. Jesus said, I know your works, I know this, I have this going, you have this going for you, I have that going for you, but repent, repent. One example would be, he says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works. Repent. But how often do we hear that word mentioned? Repent. You know, a trumpet needs to be heard in our land saying, repent, repent. It says in Joel 2.1, blow ye the trumpet and sound the alarm. They needed to hear this. And I believe that holiness is the soil of revival. Holiness is the soil of revival. Revival will only come when the church repents. I'm going to read that verse I read earlier in Isaiah 57 again to you. I'm reading it in the Amplified this time. It says, Thus is the holy and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and with him who is of a thoroughly penitent, penitent and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the thoroughly penitent, bruised with sorrow for sin. Bruised with sorrow for sin. Do you remember, Joshua was on the border of entering the promised land, 
But what had he to do first? Consecrate yourselves, he had to say to the people. It says, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Consecrate yourselves. And I believe a revival of holiness is what's coming to this land and people will awaken unto righteousness. It was David Wilkerson who said this, that really moved me. He said, there will arise a crescendo of voices crying out to the Lord, cleanse us, consume us, lift us out of the mire and filth of this age, bring us back to holy living and heavenly mindedness, purify us and keep us unspotted from the world. And he went on to say, saints of God, if you feel this same inner stirring, ask God to make you nauseated with sin, nauseated with worldliness and materialism. Pray for a new hunger and thirst for God's fullness. Get back to the secret closet of prayer. Don't miss out on the next great move of God's spirit in the land. David Wilkerson. And back to Andrew Strom in his book, True and False Revival. He wrote deep repentance, daring faith, and agonizing spirit-filled prayer have always been the keys to genuine revival in any age. And this, of course, applies to everybody, not just those in ministry. He says, if my people, it's for all of us, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, I've circled that in my Bible, then it says, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their lands. If you, then I. If you, then I. And what does this verse tell us results in revival? It says that thy people may rejoice in thee. Wilt thou not revive us again? Remember? That thy people may rejoice in thee. You see, revival sparks joy. Psalm 85 verse 6, that thy people may rejoice in thee. It's an overflow of a forgiven soul. I think there's a song about that too somewhere. The overflow of a forgiven soul. And you know, when I think of joy, the one verse that really stands out to me, if, if you're asked to give a verse in joy, you probably go to Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. But you know what preceded that very verse? What led up to that being spoken? Well, when Nehemiah, way back in chapter 1, he heard the news that Jerusalem was in ruins. Hanani had come back and he brought this bad report that the, the place was in ruins and the gates were burned, the wall was down. And he was really upset by this and he sat down and he wept, it says. And in fact, if you read the prayer that he prayed in chapter 1, it was a true prayer of repentance. And then it tells you he prayed for four months about this. And then God showed him what needed to be done. And he rallies the people around him, gets the team together. But not everyone likes what he's starting, what God's starting. And it says, as you go through the book, when Symbalat the Horonite and who was a Tobiah and Geshem, when they heard of it, it says, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. Then it says, when Symbalat heard we were rebuilding the wall, he was furious and he was indignant and he mocked the Jews. They mocked the work of God. It says, will you revive these stones? uses the word revive. Will you revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? So he belittles what Nehemiah is trying to do. And then someone else says, whatever they build, even if a fox climbs on top of it, it'll break down their stone wall. And as you read through the book, there are many different tactics that the enemy uses to try and trap the work, try and trap him and test the work of God. They try and compromise, come let's meet together in the plain of Ono. But he said, oh no, remember, to Ono because that was dangerous. He wasn't going to uh, get uh, sidetracked. Then they try lies and gossip that were spread about him. They couldn't fault him in anything, so they made up stuff. And they spread all these lies to try and stop him. Again, Nehemiah just prays, Lord, strengthen my hands. 
So they tr then tried to sidetrack him with a false prophecy. But he kept faithful and he accomplished all that the Lord had called him to do. And it tells you the walls were built in 52 days. So the walls were secure, but the people then gather. The people need revived. It was time for revival among the people. And so they gather, it tells you in chapter eight, at the water gates. And they ask Ezra to bring the book. This was the start of it, bring the book. Let's get back to the truth. Bring the book, they say to him. And he brings the book and he reads from the book and it says the people repented. They wept when they heard God's word. They were weeping and weeping and repenting. And that's when you come to that verse. Don't sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy followed the revival. The joy followed the revival. The repentance led to the revival that led to the rejoicing. We know when there's genuine revival that it spells out to the people as well. And you know, it tells us in the Bible there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. So as people come to the Lord, they're rejoicing not only in the church, they're rejoicing in heaven. Revival equals rejoicing tells us the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but righteousness and joy, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. David, remember after his prayer, repentance said, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And then ending tonight, just verse nine of chapter 80, er, of Psalm 85, surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory, that glory, may dwell in our land. That word glory is from the Hebrew root that means to be weighty, to be heavy, referring to the heavy presence of God. Remember Habakkuk again, he'd said, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters, of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Glory, that glory may dwell in our land. Do we want to see his glory? his presence in our land. And it says in verse 11, truth shall spring out in the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. We need to picture this because that's so picturesque. And Spurgeon, he put it even beautiful. He said, carpet it with truth and canopy it with righteousness. So can you see this land carpet it with truth, the truth of God's word and canopy it with his righteousness. Isaiah, he wrote, said, truth has fallen in the street. And that may describe our day. Truth has fallen in the street. And people really don't have an ear to hear it. But it's subject to change. It's subject to change. Lord, you have been favourable to our land. Restore us, O God of our salvation. Will you not revive us again? That thy people may rejoice in thee.